Good evening, and thank you, everyone, for attending our, our current seminar. Um, tonight we're doing something a little bit different. I'm actually going to be quiet, more or less. And um, this lovely lady sitting next to me, who I'm about to introduce, will be giving most of tonight's discussion, and I'll try my best to just keep it to a minimum for me. Um, I'm very proud to introduce this lady. This is actually the person who brought me into the field of molecular biology and biochemical imbalances. We actually go all the way back to medical school together. We were great friends. Um, I was, I guess, in her little group of individuals uh, as a clique, so to speak, and I suffered the torture of being the only male amongst four females. I know I seek my revenge and do so every day on a daily basis. <laughs> um, Dr. Bowman went to Chicago Medical School. Uh, she went to Illinois Wesleyan as an undergraduate. Um, she became chief resident at one of the premier institutions in Chicagoland, Resurrection Hospital. Um, she was actually so fabulous that the chief of the surgery department came and spoke to her chief resident, or her attending, excuse me, to try to steal her into the Department of Surgery. I'm glad she didn't go that route because we would have lost out on a great, great, great practitioner. Uh, Dr. Bellman is absolutely skilled in the field of women's health as well as pediatrics. She's a family practitioner by trade and all around Excellent, excellent position. Um, without further ado, uh, as I promised, Dr. Judith Bowman, founder, co-founder, and a partner at Mensa Medical, and my colleague extraordinaire, Dr. Bowman. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to talk about a subject, of course, that's dear to my heart. I've done women's health for about a good eight years at the Lake County Health Department. Of course, now, that information combined with what I know now really gives me a lot of insight as to what's going on with women, the whole estrogen question. And of course, uh, tonight's particular topic has to do with copper and what that has to do with anything in terms of women's health and some of the choices that we have today. Um, I'd like to say at least this. Um, not every woman will fall in the category that I'm going to speak of relative to her ability to metabolize copper, which is really what the topic is about. Um, this isn't um, something that all women must go through or fall under that category. So I usually start off by talking about um, just copper in general. Now copper, male or female, because we do have some males in the audience here today. Um, copper has a tendency of causing some difficulties when it's in excess. We do need it. It's a, uh, a metal that is very much so used by the body for certain things um, to happen. It's almost like an enzymatic sort of a thing that copper can do for you in many good ways, but in excess, it can be a problem. Where do we use copper? Well, in life in general, we use it in electrical devices simply because it's a great conductor of electricity and it's almost exclusively used to do that. Well, when you consider that your brain is electrical chemical to begin with, you have to start thinking about excesses that might be there. And when they are there, you simply short circuit processes, okay? So if you had a thought that was merely on its way doing something, an old gang of coppers sitting over in the corner, they might just kind of deviate that process, whether it's an emotion or whether it is a, um, a feeling, an emotion, a, a thought process, a thought, period. Those things can be deviated and simply short-circuited in excess when copper is in excess. And so that's a problem. So, so where does the woman question kind of come into play here? Okay, studies were done, and uh, actually, uh, Dr. Walsh and Dr. Creighton, um, back in the days of the Clifford Treatment Center, had actually done a study on women who had postpartum depression. Well, lo and behold, they actually found out 99.9% uh, .9 of them, in fact, all the women that they had tested, actually had copper levels that were through the roof two and three times as high as what you would expect anyone to have. Um, they also found out that these were the same women that were not just postpartum depression women, they had postpartum psychosis or near psychosis. Now once again, keep in mind the idea of short-circuiting the brain, okay, with excess copper. Now, when a woman gets pregnant, here's the deal. Estrogen rises to support the pregnancy or else we have no pregnancy. Okay. As that happens, it's a natural physiologic response for copper to come into the system. And why is that necessary? Without copper coming into the system, 
of a pregnant woman, the baby will not produce blood vessels. They cannot grow them. Impossible. So it's a natural physiological Type response one. for estrogen to rise in support of pregnancy. Okay. And when estrogen rises, copper comes into the system so that the baby will develop blood vessels. It does not happen any other way. Okay? So the pregnancy goes along, everything is fine. And uh, when the pregnancy is over, the copper level is supposed to come back to baseline or normal. In many cases, they do not. That particular female whose copper cannot be metabolized or excreted appropriately is at a new set point of higher copper levels. Okay? So she's no longer, say, the number, the cutoff is 110. I'm just giving you a number, throwing it out there. Uh, she will be some higher number. Okay? So, all right, she has another baby. She's at a new set point to begin with. The couple rises a little bit more. It's supposed to come back to baseline. It does not. And she's at a higher set point. What I'm telling you is by the time the second, third, or even fourth child comes along, her copper levels could be high in the sky. They really could be. This is where you start hearing those horrible stories about, oh, she shot her husband once to strangle her kids, jumped off the building. You hear these stories all the time about postpartum psychosis. We heard them recently. There's a lot of stories that were in the news, even recently. This young lady, I believe, that was uh, in Washington, D.C., that ran her car into the some, I don't know, had an accident or something. I think in Washington, D.C., the first thing I'm thinking of was, oh, my God. It said she had just had a baby, and I'm thinking, oh, gosh, how we could have helped that woman. You know, and um, it just... Really, it's a very sad situation where something can be done about it, believe it or not. So, so you have this particular subset of females who is not able to excrete copper. There are also a subset of women, okay, who feel they need, here we go, uh, hormone replacement therapy. Some women also will use birth control pills, not, not a new uh, finding. We know that that's uh, up and alive and well these days. Bottom line is, any exogenous or estrogen from the outside, no matter where it comes from, it could be natural. She could be an estrogen-dominant female and just naturally has high levels of estrogen. Or she could be using estrogen from the outside, meaning that she's on birth control pills. Or she could be using hormone replacement therapy. It's estrogen from the outside. Any time that that happens, you have to wonder whether or not she's that female who can or cannot excrete copper. Like I was saying, it is not all women that this happens to. Dr. Bowen, mm -hmm. from all your years of working with women's health and literally thousands of patients that you've seen, have you noted any correlations between physical symptomatologies and physical distortions relative to females and copper in general? There are quite a few. Unfortunately, I have to say that. Um, getting back to the whole copper thing, period, whether it's male or female, Copper, in and of itself, with nothing else being the problem whatsoever, causes issues. Let's just name them for you. Uh, copper tends to be excitatory. It will take one of your more calming neurotransmitters, dopamine, and push that pathway towards adrenaline. First there's norepinephrine, then there's epinephrine, which is adrenaline, and it will actually make that person more, more uh, at risk for things like panic disorder or anxiety, uh, simply because it's converting dopamine straight into norepinephrine, which goes into epinephrine. So that by itself is a problem. So many times you'll hear some women say, well, you know, I didn't have this problem until maybe I started um, these birth control pills. Of course, she doesn't know her estrogen levels went up and that her copper level went up, and that actually shifted dopamine production straight to epinephrine or adrenaline, and now she's having anxiety and panic attacks. But that's not the only thing that it does, okay? The other thing that it can do is interrupts her energy cycles, um, glycolytic cycle, the Krebs cycle, in three different places so that she's not able to produce enough energy. Her ATP, and we're all taught in medical school, where you produce 36 in a normal cycle, she's probably producing less, so she's going to feel, guess what, fatigued or not having enough stamina to, to perform what it is she needs to perform on a regular basis. She's feeling a lot more tired. Um, not something that she wants, but you also hear this. A lot of these same women will complain of chronic fatigue syndrome. They'll also complain or have symptoms akin to 
uh, fibromyalgia, okay? And a lot of times we have found out, I, I have yet to see a woman whose copper levels were really very, very high, not complain about fatigue, or I also have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. I also have a diagnosis of chronic fatigue. And you know, my head is going off, ding, ding, ding. You know, okay, I wonder if this is a copper toxic female. Dr. Bowman, you talked about copper and its mm -hmm. relationship to blood vessel development and right. vascular issues. Mm -hmm. Have you noted in your experience any correlation between copper levels and things like fibroids or endometriosis in females? Well, thank you for that prompting, Dr. Nutson. Um, in actuality, let's go back to the idea that it takes copper to help develop blood vessels, okay? So now, we get the complaint with many of our patients in the history that we get that, gee, you know, my doctor, my OBGYN said that I have fibroids, or I've also been diagnosed with endometriosis. So what has happened? Well, okay, there's no baby in there developing blood vessels, but copper is needed for blood vessel development, and so it simply bulks up the normal tissue and feeds that, and so now we get a uterus that looks like Mickey Mouse with fibroids, either on the outside or the inside. And with that, you know, many of you know this, um, when you have that scenario, there tends to be menorrhagia or heavy bleeding. And so her menstrual cycles are very long and very, very full. They tend to be that way. And so now we're creating more or less the anemic female in addition to women who has fibroid tumors. The other thing is that uh, there's a subset of women that simply just have um, uh, endometriosis. And once again, basically, we have endometrial tissue. If she has high copper levels, of course, you know that tissue can, can be anywhere in the abdominal um, area. It finds its way even sometimes to some women's lungs, believe it or not. And um, if she is, has elevated copper levels when she has menstrual cycles, those areas also bleed and are extremely painful. And Dr. Bowman, you mentioned that um, as we were talking previously that sometimes there's a deficiency in the, in the element called molybdenum right. that is actually sort of key into, into both sides of this process, mm -hmm. both the cognitive and the physiological. Could you expand upon that a little bit more? If there's any existence of uh, malabsorption in her system or anybody's system for that matter, um, these particular women though, uh, more than likely, do not have a lot, enough molybdenum, we call it Molly B for short. But molybdenum is what it's called. And it's a natural element. It's found in foods and soil and whatnot. If you're able to absorb it, it tends to sequester copper, percent free copper. And so if there's enough in your diet, if there's enough in the soil where you live, that kind of scenario, you might be a good absorber of uh, molybdenum, in which case maybe you don't have this problem. And let me make a little bit of a clarification here in, the terms, um, in terms of molybdenum and malabsorption and any of that kind of stuff there. Um, there is a thing called percent free copper. There's total copper and there's percent free copper. Percent free copper really is the bad guy. Okay. Um, little story I usually tell that Dr. Lisa gets a little bit irritated when I tell the story, but seems to paint the picture. Uh, I'm going to tell it to you anyway. <laughs> it's the magic school bus. It's the magic school bus, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. The yellow school bus that everybody knows. Okay. There is a protein called ceruloplasmin. Ceruloplasmin is the yellow school bus. Think of it like that. Yellow school bus ceruloplasmin. It is the protein that keeps copper out of trouble. Once copper is attached or inside the yellow school bus, there's no problem with it. It is not a free radical, because we're talking about free radical status here, okay? So, so where's copper? Copper's going to be the little school children, probably the little gang members though, okay? So the school bus is going along and stops at the stops, picks up the school kids, i.e. copper, free radical copper. They get on the bus. They are escorted to where they need to be. They get off the bus, they go into school, come out of the school, get back on the bus. So it is utilized and dispenses copper as needed where it's needed. But what you don't want are kids outside the bus not getting on, okay? The problem with that is there's many people who do, there are many people that do not have enough school buses, people who do not produce enough cerebroplasmin, and if they do not, they're going to have percent free copper, free roaming and just roaming around. Uh, copper in excess and charged particle that it is will do damage to cells. It will do damage to DNA. It will cause the problems that we're talking about. 
we have seen cases where uh, I looked at, at a lady's copper level that it appeared to be, oh, very, very, very high, but then again, her, her ability to produce cerebroplasmin was also very, very, very high. So the percent free copper was not an issue. And for us, anything over 25% is problematic. But I've seen very high coppers and very low percent free copper. And, I, and, it, and it brings to my mind, I'll say, oh, okay, this is why she really hasn't toppled. She's okay because her percent free copper is actually in check. But when you see greater than 25%, you're automatically going to expect some difficulties with uh, copper metabolism or dysmetabolism. Dr. Bowman, very interestingly, mm -hmm. as a family practice physician by your original training, mm -hmm. you tend to have a very global picture and perspective of issues that come up from both a physiological and a biochemical um, perspective. And you were talking about high levels of cerebroplasm and uh, certainly what about low levels of cerebroplasm? Because we know cerebroplasm is a protein. Right. And as a protein, it would probably bear some relationship to levels of albumin or pre-protein structures. Sure. What do you consider to be a, a problem or what do you think about when you see a low cerebroplasm level that would therefore well, affect copper? you generally will see a person who's probably has a, who has a nutritional deficit to begin with. Um, you look at albumin production, I think many of you are familiar with that. Um, the albumin level will give you a clue as to whether or not they really have enough nutrients on board, whether or not they have enough protein on board, whether or not they can actually make enough ceruloplasmin. And we've also noted that when you have a nutritional deficit, ceruloplasmin levels seem to be a little bit on the lower side. Now, I don't know whether you know this or not, but even in mainstream medicine, there is a, uh, an absolute uh, rule that you have to follow. If the ceruloplasmin is below a certain level and the copper levels are also extremely low, Generally, that's a flag to say, I wonder if this person has something called Wilkins disease. So even mainstream medicine is aware that the, the amount of copper and the amount of cerebroplasmin are indeed extremely important. People who have Wilson's disease are thought of as, if it's a psychiatric disorder, it is indeed by symptom. Um, they generally, this is one that kind of straddles the fence because your the psychiatric disorders generally don't have an explanation as to why there is that disorder. If it becomes psychiatric, then you can't explain why. However, for Wilson's disease, um, the, the manifestations and the symptoms are very much so psychiatric in nature. And that particular person really doesn't have a, too much of a great prognosis. Uh, but this is one where copper in the bloodstream is very, very low, cerebroplasmin is very, very low, but copper is being stored or sequestrated in the liver. The liver has become severely toxic with copper, which means that over time, that person will not have liver function, period, is an only course for destruction or death. In the meantime, though, um, psychiatrically, um, they don't function well. They would appear to be anything from schizophrenic to bipolar, but anyway, it would be a psychiatric symptom diagnosis. And so, even in mainstream medicine, this whole copper issue and cerebroplasmin issue are the uh, problematic or not the right uh, amounts in the amount of there. Mm -hmm. Dr. Roman, we've been talking a lot in uh, the recent literature and, and uh, mm -hmm. all over TV about certainly the, the increase of certain cancers that we've seen in females. And mm -hmm. certainly there may not be a tremendous increase in breast cancer, but it's so prominent and it's so prevalent that that's something we have to consider. And we've talked about the idea of certain breast cancers being uh, estrogen sensitive mm -hmm. and being related to certain genes mm -hmm. and gene activation. Could you care to comment a little bit on possible relationships or correlatives between copper and, and cancer? Uh, the breast cancer societies in general have made it pretty clear that there are genes that can predispose women to be more at risk for breast cancers or women's uh, cancers to begin with. Uh, the BRCA gene, the RCA gene, something all her two mean they are. Um, genetic indicators that would suggest that this person is at risk. It doesn't mean they're going to come down with it, but a lot of women these days, and we've seen them, uh, Robin Roberts, I think, on the news and a couple of other um, news people have come forward with their stories relative to breast cancers that, are, that they've developed, and uh, many of them are just simply electing to, I think uh, Angelina Jolie did too, right, to have a double mastectomy done. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that 
if you do have this particular genetic marker, um, your risk for developing that goes up pretty high. A lot of women just don't want to take the chance. But they just rather not have them. Maybe they'll just go through uh, reconstructive surgery, whatever, to have you know female form in terms of breast. But they would rather not go down that road and guess when when is this going to happen to me? If this is going to happen to me? Then here's a so, hard question. Mm -hmm. If we're looking at these correlations, we know that, for example, oral contraceptive pills, mm -hmm. um, OCD birth control pills, right. will increase estrogen mm -hmm. and therefore increase copper. If you haven't been tested for one of these genes, uh, with the BRCA gene or the Peritone gene, are you kind of playing a little bit of Russian roulette with regard to increasing the risk for some of these cancers? Well, the OBGYN that I've talked to, some of them are strata defense, others are not so strata defense. They are, many of them are telling me as a women who want hormone replacement, um, first of all, they're doing really extensive history and screening of the women in the family and of that person to begin with, have you ever had any cancers, have you any difficulties with your mammograms, or how your pap smear has been, anything like that, because they're screening for the potential of risk. What they really don't know, uh, what's not common knowledge, is this estrogen copper relationship, okay? And they're also screening now for those women who uh, seem to have family members that have developed uh, breast cancers, they're screening by giving them the test, the uh, test for the uh, BRCA, BRCA gene. So if they can do that, if the answers come back uh, more high risk than not, they are not recommending hormone replacement. Many of them are not recommending birth control pills. Although, like I said, it's not widely uh, known in terms of the connection between copper and estrogen and the development of blood vessels, i.e. the blood vessels feed tumors. If you have tissue and you have high copper, then you're increasing the risk of feeding that particular tumor. Um, cancer research was in this as well. Um, in terms of that, they noted that many of pe many people that have cancer also had an abundance of copper in their system. Fortunately, that just rings true with the fact that you get the development of blood vessels. Uh, one of the strategies has been to uh, give tetrahydromolybdenate, I believe it is, tetrathiomolybdenate as one of the chemotherapeutic agents. Thiomolybdenate, once again, the same thing of molybdenum, okay, same thing in order to sequester the copper that's there, i.e. try to reduce the development of the blood vessels so that the tumor is not fed. That's how that works. That was a very interesting therapy yeah. that they were trying. It was actually going through various trials uh, with the appropriate regulatory agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, the difficulty became that the standards that are used suggest that you must actually be able to stop, not only stop the development of the tumor, but actually cure the issue. And the tetrathiomolybdenate, they're right. actually able to stop the growth of the development of the tumor. But because it didn't cure the cancer, the, the drug was not approved by the FDA. But the tumor stopped growing. But the tumor stopped growing. Yeah. So sometimes I think we possibly might have to reevaluate kind of what our real goals are with regard to uh, regular medicine and, and how we're approaching different disease states and different disorders. Mm -hmm. So it kind of seems to me that if you could actually stop the growth of a tumor, that might give a better capacity for all the other therapies to work right. and to really help these individuals. Sadly enough, we've lost two classmates to breast cancer, mm -hmm. and one most recently in the past six or seven months. Very, very devastating. Yeah, um, OBGYN herself. She'll be dying. Absolutely, absolutely. And so these kinds of issues are very, very dear to our hearts and very, very important. So we don't just kind of take a, a glossy look at these things. We're actually trying to figure out the correlations and possibly exacerbating variables. And when we talk about these things to audiences and to people, family, friends, we kind of look at everyone as part of the family. So the issue is, if this could even be a problem, do we need to go there? And so I think we have, really have to be careful about levels of certain micronutrients that we didn't even know were problems before in any exacerbating factors or variables, mm -hmm. like oral contraceptive pills. And it's not a one-shot deal. We're talking about long-term exposures that are really the problem. Mm -hmm. Years of chronic OCP use, years of, of extra estrogen being on board. And those tend to be the issues that, that seem to be rather prevalent um, with many of the patients who develop cancer and so forth. Now, we're not suggesting by any means, I don't want to hear anything about, well, you guys talking about a cure for cancer. No, we're not. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about are supporting 
these kinds of states with reasonable logic and science and just trying our best not to exacerbate things and to be able to provide the most appropriate discussions for patients and even just individuals who call or just have email questions or however situations want to be posed. Um, I want to kind of change the subject now. I don't want it to be sexist, and you know, but I've got to let's turn to the men and the boys here for a minute. Okay. Um, oftentimes it's said men, we men are really just big boys. It just never really grew up, and I'll admit it, it's true. Um, nothing like doing better than going to the store and picking up a little car for my daughter. Or anything, or yeah, right. for her. Anyway, um, let's talk about copper and the effect on males. What effects, what would you say are some of the key situations or, or key exposures that are occurring for uh, young boys or, or men? How are they affected by top issues? One of the first things that we hear from parents is opposition and defiance. And, uh, Dr. Walsh will tell you, oh my, um, a high copper male, how's he doing in school? Very often these are the same kids that are in trouble with the law before they're 15. They had a run in with a police officer or some authority figure in a big kind of way. Copper tends to just simply uh, push their button. They're very impulsive. They don't think first. They act first. They impulsively do whatever, and it's usually the wrong thing, not the right thing, and then maybe remorseful afterwards. But they tend to be very, very um, high strung and impulsive, uh, oppositionally defiant, angry young men. They tend to be that way. Mm -hmm. What tends to be their prognosis if they're untreated? Well, typically beyond uh, age 15, age 16. Unfortunately, like I was mentioning, they get in trouble with authority figures. These kids are in jail um, way too early and um, have committed some of the more treacherous uh, crimes. I hate to say that, but that's generally what we see. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a genetic relationship? Is there sort of a um, a transition that can occur between parent and child with regard to copper issues, especially young males, as we see this relationship between females, mother and child, and often entire families of the females will be extremely elevated on testing. Yeah. You've seen that. What about the males? Do we see a correlation between the sons mom and of son? the mothers with high copper levels? Just basically where he's going with that. Okay. Um, yes, it doesn't have to be the female line or you follow the female line in terms of high copper levels, like it's going to go from one female to the next. No, it can go to the sons as well. And when you see that, that's where you have the difficulties. Uh, often, uh, because of growth and children grow, they need lots of zinc to grow. Okay. However, when copper levels are elevated, zinc levels seem to be suppressed by the copper levels. And because of that, if you have this copper zinc imbalance where copper is the dominant one, then you generally will see behavior disorders, disruptive behavior disorders in males particularly. You don't see it as much in females, but you do see it in males. But it doesn't always have to be a genetic variable. It can be environmental no. influences right. on, right. on the copper yeah. levels in both males and females. Mm -hmm. What are some of those environmental uh, exposures? Well, you know, I hate to say this one, but we all love it. But the chocoholics among us, there's a lot of copper in chocolate, a lot. And if you have it on a regular basis, you could be increasing um, your, your uh, copper levels. But seafood, seafood is one of them. Lord knows I love it. The good news is good news and bad news. Lots of copper, but also a lot of zinc. And very often they can balance out, so you're kind of okay. But there's also things that we like to nibble on. There's some nuts and almonds and, and sunflower seeds and things like that that actually have a lot of copper in them as well. And anyone can Google anything that says all oh, the foods high in copper and find out exactly what they are. It does not mean you can never have these things, but if you don't know what your um, copper status is, you know, you might want to have a little caution there. All things in moderation. That's all. Dr. Bowman, you're good with diet. You've checked out your genetic status. Mm -hmm. You evaluated the family and friends. Mm -hmm. You read all the books and realized that there's nothing that seems to be going on with with uh, exposure to copper from the perspective of diet or, or genetics. Okay. But yet you see family members or, or kids or children who are still having these kind of behaviors and they seem very similar to the ones that describe in the books and, and so forth. What about the, the living arrangements in, in the home or or perhaps uh, water sources. Right. What kind of uh, elements might we see? We all have to think things? about, yeah, we all have to think about copper piping. You know, it's pretty common to have copper piping there. 
um, very often that can be the source, but don't forget. Um, other than the fact that you have water running through there, perhaps not filtering your water and just drinking it straight up, that could be one source, but it'll also come through the shower as well. It's kind of a mist kind of a thing as well. And uh, if you happen to be a person that can't get rid of it, you're still exposed. You really are. Um, occupational hazards, of course, those are the obvious ones. It depends on what what you're doing, uh, what your job description is. If you work in a uh, metal factory somewhere and you're dealing with copper, or if you're a solder, or the, that solders copper things together, those kind of exposures will also increase your eyes with being uh, copper toxic. So, Indeed, I think you had a patient um, about four years ago mm -hmm. who was taking an art class. Yeah. And uh, she was working almost exclusively with copper mm -hmm. for a good semester, and she became fairly ill at that point. Well, that she did. Problem. She did. She was one of those females that could not excrete it in a manner that would be beneficial to her, and so the copper level just simply rose and rose. And after a while, she suddenly developed anxiety and depression. We couldn't figure out where or why. And so we did check that, and uh, were able to put her on a program to help get rid of the uh, excess copper or the percentage of copper. She came to you and now she's a happy woman. Well, because she is a happy woman. She is indeed. <laughs> One of the uh, the other interesting sources, um, we talk about certainly the, the pipes and copper pipes, but mm -hmm. even sources like well water right. can seem to be a problem, especially in farming communities and more rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, one community that you deal with a lot is the Amish community. The Amish community tend to have high copper. They tend to have high copper because they use well water. Everybody's well water is not the same. All well water is not equal. And they tend to live in communities where there tends to be a lot of copper in the uh, well water. So they come in with uh, anxiety and a little depression and whatnot, and a little bit of impulsivity at times. Um, interesting enough, though, that's one community. And as an aside, you'll see uh, metal disc metabolism with this group. What you don't see is autism. I wanted to add one more factor to um, this whole copper estrogen issue. A lot of times with many of the women that, that we treat, um, there's a methylation issue. Um, the combination is this. Okay, estrogen rises, copper comes in, obviously there's an issue. Um, if you have a female, you find out that she is also under methylated, her risk factor goes up. And the question is why is that? Okay. Undermethylated individuals, a study was also done by by people that have cancers, or have more cancer, more cancers than other groups, are generally undermethylated, okay? Meaning not enough methyl groups. Why is that important? Well, it turns out that methyl groups, I'm gonna say this, cover or hide some cancer genes. And so if there's not enough methyl groups around, that kind of raises her risk factor for developing cancers or having them exposed. Okay. So it's a risk factor kind of thing. So once again, it's sort of a multi-hit multi theory, theory on yeah. cancer, um, on, on certain types of cancers. Right. Um, cancer exposure under methylation, mm -hmm. um, excuse me, copper exposure copper under methylation, exposure. as well as a variety of other things. Once again, sort of a, a multi-hit phenomenon right. on that, that different topic. Right. So, Dr. Bowman, when you see a patient and she comes in for um, anxiety, depression, and you also see that there are physiological issues that are present, um, things like endometriosis or fibroids, mm -hmm. is your number one thought going on here that this woman is copper toxic, that this person is copper toxic? I'm thinking of it. Doesn't mean I'm saying she's absolutely that way, but I have to think about that. It's like, oh, okay, I know what this lab's going to come back looking like. I do, and very clearly it does. But not all the time. You know, they'll always get it right. But okay, well, time. let's put you on the spot. Okay. How many times have they come back where they weren't copper toxic in those scenarios? Not many. But <laughs> like that, not many. Most of the time they were. Very PC. Mm -hmm. Very PC. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Um, but we do note that, and you have noted actually, a very mm -hmm. significant relationship. So, right. one of the things we want to share with uh, the young folks out there is that. Don't think that there's always a separation. I'm actually quite infamous for saying that nowadays we see that the brain and the body, even though they're connected, they're not necessarily the same in the sense that what is good for one is good for the other. But in this particular case, we see correlatives that what affects one does affect the other. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about issues that are physiological in nature, we also have to be aware that they could have cognitive ramifications. I think that's one of the real tape-ons about copper and copper toxicity. 
um, many individuals will note, especially our nutritionists, that individuals who've got bowel dysfunction because they're nutrient poor or because there's an inflammatory bowel disease also have cognitive issues. They can be anxious, they can be depressed, they can have poor processing. Foggy brain issues occur with individuals. They can't process anymore. Mm -hmm. And oh, and let's not forget that multi thing that's coming up that I'm anticipating in two weeks, which is Thanksgiving, where yeah. we all tend to, at least as I like to say, gluttonize ourselves. Mm -hmm. At least some of us do. I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. And um, after a good Thanksgiving meal, what do we tend to sit back and do? Sleep. Well, Tryptophan just kind of puts you out. You yes. That turkeys. But where's that sleep really occurring? It's not that our bodies just lie limp and our heads are going, you know, mm -hmm. we fall asleep cognitively. So there is a connection, and I think that's one of the things we have to be aware of. It's not just the the, um, the foodstuffs, mm -hmm. but elements like copper, other metals, um, can also affect gut, mm -hmm. body, as well as brain in a dysfunctional fashion. Okay. Well, Dr. Bowman, I want to thank you for coming out of your shell. And by the way, what she didn't tell you was that she was the lead physician in that study that was done. And she was on television, actually, as two different media outlets came to um, talk to uh, us about the whole copper issue, along with Dr. Walsh. Um, very humble. Uh, when the senator from Illinois, Bobby Rush, uh, did his thing for the study of postpartum depression and, and created funding by way of an actual, was it a law or was it a, I believe it was a law, no, a law. in the, the state law. of Illinois, Dr. Bowman was invited amongst the panel members of female specialists. Um, SSRIs will work for people who are generally under methylated, okay? They do have their place. Um, it's an antidepressant, and she's feeling depressed, and it works for her. It's more than likely because it has to do with her methylation status, and her methylation status is likely under methylated. She has to have enough. They're very effective for that. For people who are over methylated, um, they tend to push her in the wrong direction. She won't respond at all, or she will tend to have a... Um, a different response basically worsening as opposed to getting better. Because what you're doing is um, methylation. Let me put it like this. Histamine levels. Regular old histamine that we all know, same histamine, why do people take antihistamines because their histamine is out of control and it's giving them terrible symptoms because of allergy season and blah blah blah. When histamine levels are elevated, that's usually a sign that that person is under methylated. Okay. SSRIs and a lot of the psychotropic medications are all antihistamines. If you give a person with high histamine an antihistamine, they will respond, and it's usually a better response. I.e., the depressant, the antidepressant, will probably have a good effect on them, regardless of their proper level. But she's got two things going on. One is being masked by the, um, the uh, antidepressant, so she's feeling a little bit better, but her proper levels are still elevated. What about the relationship, on that same note, uh, between certain medications and the depletion of zinc, which would then affect copper in the system? Um, excuse me, Depakote particularly? Sure. There are some patients that take Depakote. Depakote is used as a mood stabilizer as well as an anti-seizure medication. Patients who are on that medication, though, they don't know this. In order for Depakote to make its active ingredient, it has to take all the zinc that you have to make itself active. So they won't have seizures, so they'll have better mood. No, better mood never happens, okay? Because if zinc is gone, zinc can't get together with B6 to make serotonin. Zinc must be present for all neurotransmitter production. And so they end up with maybe no seizure, but they're getting slowly depressed more and more and more. And patients that we have that need to be on Depakote because perhaps they have a seizure disorder, we have to front load those patients with the same in order to make sure they have enough so that the medication will actually work. And the other side is if mm -hmm. they're depleting the system of zinc, mm -hmm. the copper levels are going to rise artificially, right. so you which will you actually have worsen the anxiety as well. Right. So. Good question. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I need to say this. Um, whether a female is taking bioidenticals or synthetic, it doesn't matter. They do exactly the same. You don't get the copper levels. Just so you know well, actually, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Something that a lot of people don't like to hear, but I, I'd like you to really sort of speak a little bit more about that topic. Bioidentical hormones have become extremely popular mm -hmm. over the past several years, and there's the conception 
uh, don't throw darts at me, but misconception in some cases mm -hmm. that bioidentical hormones are better than the regular synthetic hormones because they're more natural. And okay. I'd like you to comment from both a um, empirical perspective as well as the dogmatic perspective on that issue. Well, my research has shown, I've read a lot of articles about that. Um, one of the more convincing ones, though, is the Mayo, the Mayo Clinic's article that came out more recently that's suggesting that really it's all the same. Believe it or not, they're saying that there's more associated with detriment with bioidenticals. I really hate to tell you that because a lot of people are really into that. Um, but those are actually more synthetic than what is used as a, as a synthesized uh, artificial ones. Believe it or not, they're both from the same plant sources. Are both from the same plant sources. And so, um, and if they're truly bioidentical, they're going to do exactly the same thing. And they do. I've seen it. I've had patients go bioidentical, have them go uh, synthetic, and flip and go the other way, and the results are still the same. They still tend to see increases mm -hmm. in copper. Increases in copper, and well, that's just what happens. I mean, some of your patients have actually had to rethink the whole issue of whether or not they're going to continue on bioidentical hormones right. for a variety of reasons. Some, you said, were actually not experiencing any real benefit. Yeah. Many do, by the way. Oh, heck yeah. Many do. Mm -hmm. But the issue becomes one of the, the non-perfect world. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> multiple issues that are kind of resolved by bioidentical hormones, but then if we've got anxiety and depression now, we're creating a whole other right. set of issues. Well, we can talk a real world here. There, there's some patients that you will allow. There's a little bit of compromise going on here. You can get women that are so debilitated by the symptoms that they are having until they are willing to take that risk. Okay. Well, we're going to try to keep her out of trouble by giving her what she needs so that we can fight against the risk factors. In the meantime, though, she feels so debilitated without the extra estrogen on board that she had once upon a time until uh, we may allow her to go ahead and do that. Like I said, we'll just go ahead and and uh, try to protect her against the side effects of it. Sometimes you have to, you know, or else she's not going to function. Her quality of life is terrible. She can't get along without it or function well in any way um, for a period of time where um, she thinks she can tough it out. Some women just can't tough it out. Okay. Speaking of tough choices, there's mm -hmm. also the one regarding um, oral contraceptive use. Um, Terrible uh, menstrual mm -hmm. issues right. and anxiety and depression that also copper related right. and the balance there. Mm -hmm. What is your experience been? No, it's to the same thing. Those? Everything is uh, to be looked at per the individual. And what you need to do if you find yourself in a compromising position where you're going to allow them to do that is you need to just tell them to walk in with your eyes open. These are your risk factors. Okay. These are the things that are going to be better for you. These are other things may not and here are the risk factors associated with either side of it. But certainly you think about things like osteoporosis and bone health when we're thinking about her mental abilities as well. Because I've had many women tell me, you know, I really did get that depressed and my life was a lot happier before I started these oral contraceptive pills. When I think back, that's about the time I started feeling depressed, <coughs> you know. In which case, maybe she is willing to choose another form of birth control. Depends on the woman. So, uh, other women say, I'm sorry, can't do it. I'm not having any more kids. This is it. That's not going to happen to me. I need to keep this. I need to be on that. Just let them know straight up here's the deal. Here are the risk factors. Understand what you've chosen, but at least you understand why and what's going on. So, we'll try to protect them. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, um, you talked a lot about that you know, copper overload and the relation yes. to estrogen. Is yes. it related to malfunctioning in the other hormones? Copper mm -hmm. in and of itself? Yeah, like the other one. Um, Very interesting question. The question is adrenal. Is copper related to any other hormones? Okay, we talked about adrenal gland. Um, I mentioned a little while back, it's kind of a difficult connection, I guess. But since when copper is in excess, when you're talking about free radical copper, that's just available, um, it, it will take that dopamine pathway. Um, the idea is in anybody's chemistry book, dopamine, norepinephrine, which turns into epinephrine, okay, which is adrenaline, adrenaline okay. In ex excess copper acting on dopamine, it will eventually 
uh, feed into adrenal fatigue. So you have okay. adrenal fatigue eventually. Okay. Yeah. Right. If copper is high. In excess. Right. It's, it's simply going to act in two different places. One, converting dopamine into basically adrenaline way down the way there. And if that's always pumping out, eventually you'll have adrenal fatigue. But copper, once again, in the glycolytic pathways and Krebs cycles, robs you of energy. So now we have adrenal fatigue and just tiredness and fatigue in general. And so this is where you get your chronic fatigue syndrome and your fibromyalgia-like symptoms. Fibromyalgia, basically you have nerves that are being stimulated over and over and over. And when you have that, you have muscles that are being stimulated because the nerves are being stimulated. Eventually, you get muscle tenderness, point tenderness in a lot of different places because copper does nothing but irritate the heck out of nerves and nerve endings. Because once again, we're talking electronics, electricity, and copper just zapping and keeping those nerves just firing and eventually tiring out the muscle and pooping it out. Tender point tenderness, fibromyalgia symptoms. And I didn't mention this very often, it's associated with migraines. Women that have migraines, women that have tinnitus, or pin, uh, what they call it pillow pulse, where like this sensation of a uh, kind of a high pitched mm -hmm. noise that not necessarily there, but that's what they're sensing again. Mm -hmm. And then so, this is kind of basic, but did you say copper has like an electrical charge? Oh, well, yeah, is absolutely. That, that's why we use it in electronics and, and wiring. So if it's high, yeah. it would be actually like charging absolutely. your electrical system. Your tell nerves. them the story. Yeah, tell them the story about okay. the, the actual laboratory. Oh, it's like dish. a battery kind no. of thing. Just you got it. You got it. Copper, you yeah. got it. it. copper okay. top battery. Copper top battery. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, it, it leads me to a different story. How it settles. This is going to be your discussion. Okay. You um, this one. <laughs> One day we were actually kind of sitting around uh, about five years ago, and we were, we were uh, I'll, I'll get the Fiji dish. Um, and we were thinking about, well, how do we sort of approach the discussion of autism on a cellular level? So the question was, well, let's describe a cell. And so we got to the blackboard and drew a cell and all the ions that move back and forth and chemicals. And we said, you know, this really looks familiar. And so we looked up a copper top battery. And you know, the same elements that are a copper top battery are in cell. the human cell. Mm -hmm. The difference, well, it might not even be as much of a difference, it's not an engineer, but we know that with the human cell, elements move from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell and back. Mm -hmm. They're governed by electrical gradients that allow these ions to move back and forth, and that creates energy and electricity. They're also chemicals or concentration gradient. So the more there is here, the more it's going to push it out there. But things like copper, things like zinc, things like calcium, things like sodium, things like potassium, these are all charged particles. Okay. So is it a wonder that when you kind of rub your, your, your uh, the arm and your hair, if you're a guy anyway, um, static electricity occurs? There is indeed uh, the reality that we are electrical and chemical beings. Now, this concept is really nothing new. What she's getting to in the discussion about the Petri dish was a study that was done back in 1942, where scientists took a nerve cell and added five micrograms of copper, just copper, to that nerve cell, and it lit up with activity like no one's business. Mm -hmm. And that was really one of the foundational pieces to let us understand that copper is directly excitatory to nerve cells. So when you have excess copper in neural tissue, whether it's brain, whether it's skeletal muscle, anything that anywhere a nerve goes, that nerve is going to be highly activated. And the more highly activated it is for the longer period of time it is, the more you're actually going to get fatigue to the area that it's affecting. And as Dr. Bowman said, chronic fatigue syndrome to muscles, adrenal fatigue to the brain, hyperstimulation, eventually fatigue and anxiety and depression in mental circuitry or in mind processing, foggy brain issues. Mm -hmm. And indeed, you're right, copper is a charged molecule. Mm -hmm. So we have a plus two charge on one hand, and then it shifts in other directions based upon the net result of all the different ions, both positive and negative. 
that come together. So it's not just one element. We're not trying to say that. But tonight, we wanted to talk specifically about copper because of its devastating effects on multiple levels. Right. It's one of those elements we call one of the major dominoes of the microbiological world, bi microchemical world, where if you kind of increase or decrease too much here, there's this huge effect across multiple systems. Already we've talked about the gastrointestinal system, we've talked about skeletal muscle, we talked about brain tissue, nervous tissue that leads other places, the adrenal glands, hormones, uh, cancer, fibromyalgia, multiple different areas of the human system, mm -hmm. all affected by one element. It's not the only one, but in this case, it's something that we didn't pay enough attention to before, and we're revisiting that issue and trying to make sure we address these things now. You know, everything is in balance. And if you think about that battery that we talked about, all the things that are in it, your brain basically works the same way. What happens when you have that copper top battery and you put it in a little toy, the little thing starts working around just like it should, okay? What happens when the electrolytes are being worn out? What happens when they're fading away? The thing just doesn't work as well anymore because they're out of balance. And what we do is basically put things in balance. You give your body the building blocks it needs to do what it needs to do, it will do it. But they have to be there and they have to be in balance to work right. It's really the basic theory of life. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, on the uh, environmental area, there's places, maybe offices, buildings that are called cancer clusters. Yeah. And that's because mm -hmm. there's a big generator or transformer that's throwing out some very power electricity or mm -hmm. electromagnetic mm -hmm. uh, interference fields mm -hmm. at the individual if they're working there eight hours a day. And then uh, one book has that they, they showed that in that building there's a higher cancer incidence near the generator, let's say on the third floor, than on the second, third, and fourth floor. You know? So how does that tie in with copper? Is it, is it big or small? That's a very good question. I'm not sure we know the exact answer in terms of relationships between electromagnetic field energy and the copper in and of itself. We know that there is a relationship with regard to um, EMFs, um, and the development of copper, or excuse me, the development of cancer in multiple ways and shapes and forms. We're just not sure of the exact mechanism. Once again, that could be a multifactorial phenomenon. Um, the what are some of the, the, absolutely, the epigenetics, um, predispositions. We know that we are, of course, electromagnetic beings. If we weren't, there would be no such thing as an MRI. What happens when we take an MRI? We get a great picture that makes x-rays look like nothing. We see nerves, we see bones, we see muscles, all because we've got magnetic resonance imaging, mm -hmm. magnetism being uh, attached to the human body, and the interaction producing great, great discussions and the emissions of, uh, of radiation and pictures. We have to know, therefore, that where there's magnetism, there's electricity. Where there's electricity, there's magnetism. And since we're both, there has to be some effect. Now. Exactly how that works, we're not too terribly sure, but we do know that there is some correlation. Is it copper alone, or is copper a great conductor somehow mm -hmm. of that process as an intermediary? We're not yet sure. Um, one of the leading uh, countries in that realm is actually Norway, Scandinavian countries. They're actually the only country in the world that believes that there is a relationship between what well, they actually classify EMF type issues as being a real disease, not just a disorder, but a disease. And there's tons of studies coming out of there on that subject. So I might actually refer you to um, looking online at a lot of the studies from Norway. But for us, we know there is a relationship, we just don't know exactly what that is, and it's not 100% confirmed. Dr. Goldman in another life was a nuclear med tech, okay. so she's more we expert on magnetism than I am. Yeah. Any other questions? How would you test for an emission of copper level? Is it just a blood test? That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Standard mainstream Standard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. well, you know, there are actually a few answers to that. Um, many individuals will look at hair. Many individuals will look at urine. Many individuals look at blood. And then there are individuals who look at all three. Mm -hmm. And the real question is, what's copper doing in the hair? If you just use a hair analysis, for example, 
NAC copper, well, that could be a contaminant. That could also mean that the body is very efficient at removing copper from the system. Yeah, there's always a problem. Okay. There is basically, unfortunately, beautiful, we spend millions of dollars, billions of dollars on it, head poop. Okay. <laughs> it's designed to eliminate toxins from the system. It's true. So if somebody's using only hair to determine copper toxicity, the question is, is the body just really efficient at getting rid of all that? Mm -hmm. You need a correlative test. And one of the best correlative tests around is to look in the blood. Mm -hmm. If you see, no if you okay. see high levels of copper no, in the blood that. and the hair, then you can reasonably assume that the hair is referencing toxic levels of copper in the system. But you can't base it just on that one test. Many people will do a provocative urine challenge, for example, to determine if um, the copper that's coming out is being excreted from the urine. That too can have its issues depending on the renal function capacity of the individual in terms of processing those metabolites. But we find that the most consistent single test for copper toxicity is actually based on the blood sample. Mm -hmm. And it's usually a serum copper level that right. we use. And it's a standard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised what um, standard mainstream medicine is able to test with this month. Okay. Mm -hmm. They don't recognize the same significance mm -hmm. as we do in the, in the microchemistry world. Okay. So we do specialty testing, but it's because the tests do exist. It's actually there. Mm -hmm. So for many individuals that we've been talking about, a simple serum copper test, we'll if know. elevated, will tell you mm -hmm. quite a bit of information. The key after that is to find the right practitioners to help you deal with it right. and to make sure they understand what that means. Okay. Ma'am, you had a question. Well, then, um, just talking about chocolate. Chocolate, anyway, has a lot of serotonin in it. And so the fact that it puts you that one or taste for it. You know, the endorphins are going in there, and serotonin is there as well. So it's just a pleasurable experience. And anything that's that good, you don't really care. It's just simple as that. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, you would crave it. Mm -hmm. Unlike zinc, where high zinc levels can often produce a, a metallic taste in the tongue and makes everything not quite so pleasurable, copper is not the same. It kind of sits silent and says, give me more, give me more. Mm -hmm. sure. Yes, sir. For a young woman, college young woman, Mm -hmm. and she is tested when she, say, is high in copper. Mm -hmm. What's her alternative? Is there a treatment that you, that you both recommend to kind of offset that? Yes, period. So offset that. It depends on what her choices are. She says, well, you know, I need to be on this. I'm going to stay on this birth control pill. It's okay. We need to protect you to kind of offset these high copper levels or your percent free copper, we need to control that. And we were telling you before, things like molybdenum, things like um, calcium promoter enhancer um, will help to sequester the percent free copper to kind of keep her out of trouble, to keep her processing information, um, to keep her emotional stability, to keep her emotions stable, put it like that. So yeah, there's things we fight against. It's just a matter of what she wants to do. We've had many young ladies say, well, I'll just, I don't need this. You know, I'm just gonna go off of that. And we've watched their copper level go right back down to baseline. There's been other young ladies that said, well, I'll just use an alternative form and drop it. Or I'm going to stay on this. Perhaps I'll use the lowest estrogen amount that's going to be effective. In which case, we'll say, OK, you can do that. Once again, here are your risk factors. And we're going to try to protect you against what would be sort of the detrimental fallout from having high copper. And so yeah, we've done all of the above, depends on the individual, just making sure they understand risk factors as well as you know walking in with their eyes open. Honest communication is always the first step. The right. question is, mm -hmm. why are you taking the pill? Mm -hmm. For many women, it's about simply menstrual regulation, not necessarily just simply, but for menstrual mm -hmm. regulatory purposes. For others, it's birth control. Mm -hmm. um, for others, it's, I, mean, I don't know, I've just been doing it for X number of years since, you know, and I've never thought about it twice, and I'm not acting. Mm -hmm. So each one of these variables comes into play in terms of how we want to approach the discussion with the young lady right. about what to do next, mm -hmm. and what route to go, and what we suggest. I have a question. If a dark male is tested and has high estrogen levels, yeah. does it mean they have high copper? Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. We have had we have had many a adult males with high copper levels whose estrogen levels we haven't tested yet. So yeah, we don't know. 
the, the other side is that there are many males who have high estrogen and don't have high copper levels. Correct. Once again, you can also have many females with high estrogen but not have high copper levels. Correct. The question is, are their bodies designed to appropriately process that copper mm -hmm. and therefore get rid of it? Right. Now, there are males who awesome. do have high estrogen and high copper. Yeah. And for them, we can see they fall in that subset just like X number of females do, sure. where they're not able to get rid of that copper. But usually the signs and symptoms that they've had preceded them being tested for estrogen excesses, mm -hmm. meaning as children, they were impulsive. They got into trouble a lot. They um, could not compose themselves. They were remorseful after doing whatever it is they did. But seemingly by age 15 or 16, the local police department knew them very well. Kind of like if anyone watches The Simpsons, um, there's a whole drawer file on the little boy Bart Simpson. Uh, whenever the, the parents go to school, they just pull that whole drawer out. And the same for many of these kids, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. The young boys. Yeah, I think Dr. Walsh actually identified that when he was working with the criminal justice system for thousands and thousands of young men that he looked at. He looked at the hair sample, the blood sample, the urine samples, and it was pretty much, very, very much so a fact that the more impulsive, the more, um, some of the worst crimes were actually committed by the males that had high copper levels, unfortunately, or were in trouble with the law way before they were 16 years old. And indeed, a lot of the early research with regard to copper and behavior was done in prison systems mm -hmm. and actually proven by individuals like Dr. Walsh to be a, a contributing variable in the behavior disorders of many of these uh, prisoners. Right. Um, unfortunately, you know, the way our system and our way our society works, it's much easier just to put people in jail than it is to actually try to deal with the issue that's mm -hmm. going to save you money in the long run mm -hmm. and therefore hopefully keep some good people moving back in society as opposed to right. okay but, these uh, are not these are not just a little bit scary boys. These are really scary boys. Um, we had a three year old whose mother and aunt uh, would lock themselves in their room from the three year old who would go get butcher knives mm. um, yes butcher knives and um, very dangerous objects and threaten them and the other child. I mean, we're talking uh, Twilight Zone, dangerous little people. We're, I mean, these are scary. Chucky. Chucky. Yes, exactly. 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 And these are these are true stories. These are not exaggerations in the least bit. Wow. So there are families that have actually lived in separate arenas so that one parent could take care of some of the kids and the other Stay parent could take care of other one, kids. Yeah. It can be not tremendous. Not just a little scary. This is really scary. Yeah, scary. Terror scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. scary. Yeah. If if there was a child that maybe wasn't that bad, mm -hmm. but was had trouble with impulsivity and just like kind of going crazy, like almost not being able to control himself, right. would that be the same? Would you do standard blood testing? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Um, many children that have um, ADD and ADHD, some of them are just copper toxic. Okay. They're just bumping around because, well, copper's taking dopamine and pouring it into adrenaline and they just can't stop it. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. How does that go again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where are the copper sequestered? Is, is it a malfunction of kidney and liver or what? It's something in the processing. We don't know exactly how, but it is not being excreted. So it could be kidney problem. Could be. Don't really know. Don't forget, though, um, the liver has a lot to do with copper metabolism as well. The reason why there's Wilson's disease is that the liver tends to, to hoard it. I don't think that's the real problem, though, because it's not like it's in the liver, it's out in circulation. So it's probably a combination of uh, liver and kidney function. Something's not right in the excretory process. It's, it's, not, not, about, it's not about sequestration. Mm -hmm. It's actually, remember Dr. Bowman's magic school bus scenario here. Mm -hmm. um, these are the copper molecules that are out and about being active. Mm -hmm. They must hit receptor sites. Mm -hmm. Receptor sites are the little areas that therefore lead to cellular activity. Mm -hmm. And if they're not available, they can't do that. So if they were sequestered somewhere, like in Wilson's disease, where mm -hmm. it was sequestered in the, the liver, for example, they wouldn't be out causing trouble. Right. These are the molecules we were talking about as percent free copper molecules that are actually going around causing a great deal of havoc because they right. do have activity throughout the system. Yep. So it's not about sequestration. In this it sounds like free radicals. Huh? It you is. Got it. You got it.
like in the 60s, we're free radicals, dude. Free radicals. Causing right. trouble. Mm -hmm. Fighting terrorists. against the system. Mm -hmm. Anything like that's charged like that can be damaging the world. If we get to a nucleus and cause havoc in a cell, we create some different scenarios. So. But it might be more going on biologically than you observe behavior. Mm -hmm. well, there, it can be both. Yeah. can be both. So is that how it would cause the DNA damage? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Free radical damage. Um, free radical damage can be caused by um, free radicals that are just there or radiation. You know, and radiation particles for the same reason. Anything that can get to the nucleus and cause uh, damage or create free radicals produces oxidative stress. Oxidative stress, I always throw that term out there, but basically, oxidative stress, as an example, is a pretty brand new nail that you left on the table and it sat there for a week and you came back with a rusty thing. It went under oxidative stress. That's not what you want. Okay? Your brain, your entire body can go under oxidative stress which means that there's free radical damage that's actually changing that product, you know? So whether it's a brain or a bone or a piece of liver or a piece of whatever it is, if there's oxidative stress happening, we have damage going on, we have free radicals being created, free radicals are problematic, okay? Question, if, if, if the gut has 80 or 90% of your immune system or you know, your, your emotional system, uh, is that where a lot of the copper is, is in the gut um, causing a problem geographically? Copper, well, there's a couple, couple of ways copper can cause problems. It's the processing level. Usually when it's elevated, they should be working together kind of one-on-one. -on -one. But when copper is elevated, it suppresses zinc levels. When zinc levels are suppressed, your immune system takes a huge hit somewhere. Seeing as how you have a lot of that in the GI tract, your, uh, your GI tract is, is predisposed to immune system hits. And so uh, there's a, a also going along with that, you'll get malabsorptive syndromes that are developing from an inflamed gut. Okay? So. Probably. And the inflammation doesn't just stay localized to the gut, mm -hmm. it tends to spread throughout the entire system, including the brain. Right. Do you say that problematic is a cause genetic or? It can be. It could be genetic. It could be epigenetic. The question uh, between genetics and, and epigenetics and, and causes for many of these things, once again, it's multifactorial in nature. The question is, did, for example, the right blueprint in the DNA um, say to create the right protein? However, maybe an enzyme for some reason became dysfunctional and didn't read the blueprint very well and created a slightly dysfunctional protein that kind of works maybe 50% of the time, but decides to go on vacation the other 50% of the time. Mm -hmm. While it's off on vacation, the copper levels start to rise over time, mm -hmm. and it moves on. The blueprint might have been correct, the blueprint might have been wrong. It's hard to say, and we're not real sure. What well, if the whole family has similar symptoms? Then would it be then genetic? It, then indeed, it's, genetic it's more likely genetic okay. as a predisposition, yes. Well, we want to thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we've asked some great questions. We're glad to have had Dr. Bowman give us some of her time and her expertise in this area of copper and uh, well, free radical and so forth. So thank you very much. Have a great evening.